Right, okay, well, I'll start um, talking about how I got involved with casting then. Um, well, I guess I started casting in February. Uh, I got involved at a Liverpool tournament that I attended that was run by this singular guy um, who put like a thousand pounds of his own money into it. Uh, and it got like 16 teams in, and it was really good fun. And uh, at one point, they were just taking turns casting at the desk. I said, oh, can I go up and have a go? And they were like, yeah, sure. So I started casting with one of the sort of more seasoned casts. I think he was called Wawa or something. And then uh, there was another guy who cast with me. Um, and all the people in Twitch chat saying, who's this guy? He's really good. And I was like, oh, cool. So apparently I'm, I, I'm pretty decent at this. Uh, so then I sort of took that with me and I went uh, and did another casting tournament uh, just online. And then I came across the Newell because I was like, I put a Reddit post up that was saying something like, where, where is the British University esports scene? I've heard nothing about it. America have got one. Let's get this going, guys. And it got a bit of attention going and it got to front page Reddit. And then suddenly uh, Ian posted on it, I think, and then Josh got laid. And, and then Tundra originally uh, wanted to form our own breakaway one. And I was originally keen on the idea because I was like, oh, I'd quite like to be in, like, be in charge. And then I realized how much work it was going to be to do it myself, as Josh knows. And I was like, actually, I might just go and get involved with these guys because they've got a pretty sick website already. And I probably could just offer my casting skills to them if they need it. And then so I did the first Newell tournament with Josh. And it just kind of uh, snowballed from there. Obviously, Josh wasn't casting, but he got me involved as a caster, and I kind of went from there. Then I did the second tournament and part of the third tournament, and obviously came back for the qualification tournament. So that's essentially how I got involved, and uh, it's been a really good uh, time so far. I've done a couple of other tournaments here and there. I did the Harbour Injury Esports tournament. I've done a bit for EGL, who I no longer really work for. Um, and then I did got involved with NESL, but I haven't done anything with them so far, so I don't think I will, though, because I've just got so many casters, it's just not, not much point, so I enjoy working for the new. I think I'll probably just stick there, it's the easiest thing for me, and and there's a group, good group of guys, obviously Josh is brilliant, he's really d dedicated to it, you can see there's a lot of passion in what he does, and him and Ian are just, him, Ian and Tom really are all like the most hard-working people I've met in terms of trying to get esports out there. And I like casting with Dan, and obviously bringing Theory in as well, he was or one of my good friends that I'd met a couple of times. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's been absolutely amazing so far. And uh, that's basically how I got involved. So if anyone else wants to share their story. Josh. God. Josh. <laughs> come on, come on, oh, you're, you're the main guy. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so, so I, I came to university about, you know, just over three years ago, and I thought, you know, it'd be really cool, as a lot of people have seem to have thought, that it'd be... Uh, cool to have some sort of inter-university tournament so uh, we set on working on that we put this terrible website together and uh, tried charging people uh, to come and join <laughs> but nothing absolutely set up and uh, surprisingly nobody nobody signed up which is a bit disappointing so next year we came on and uh, we did lots of like um, small just one-off tournaments and a lot of different games just to see what worked and um, you know, League of Legends were just a runaway success you know we tried things like Team Fortress and Counter Strike which seemed quite popular but the League of Legends was so like cut above everything else. Uh, so we stuck with that for a bit, we run a few tournaments for that and it started building a bit of uh, momentum and uh, last year we ran sort of like our first proper season where um, we had about 16 teams turn up. Uh, Dan, uh, but you come third? I think yeah. I came third dude, yeah and yeah. then Team was fourth. I had three pentas that that year. I had three pentas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, from there we we had about fifteen, sixteen teams turn up each week, and then um, we ran our pre-season, and uh, we just ran our qualification tournament, where we've gone from like having fifteen teams to, I mean, hundred team sign up, which has just been absolutely mental, uh, which is great to see but I mean I've been following esports for uh, a number of years now I got involved with uh, Battlefield 2 which is not really much of an esports title but uh, but that quite competitive for, for a bit and then moved into Call of Duty um, where all the unskilled people go and <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I played that a uh, pretty decent level for a bit and uh, it's just something that really irritates me is the sort of like state of the British esports scene and that you know for all these years that I've been following it, nothing's really changed. Uh, there isn't one. Uh, so, now I wanted to try and do my bit, try something a little bit different, a little bit innovative to try and help, you know, build a, some sort of a platform or, you know, help supply the uh, British esports scene with something to follow and some, you know, more, more structured tournaments and uh, hopefully more players and more teams. 
Who wants to go yeah, next? Well, you've done a good job anyway. I mean, to be honest, it's, it's I think, one of the best UK tournaments that's been run with for solely UK uh, teams anyway. I haven't seen many of the UK tournaments that has managed to get over 100 UK teams in that are based in the UK. I mean, I've seen European ones do better, like I know the EGLs get sort of 124, but that's European. So mm -hmm. the, fact, the fact that we've done this in the British esports scene and just had British teams, which I know may seem slightly elitist, but it's what we're trying to do for England and for Britain's esports scene. Whoa, uh, Scotland. Think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, now we've got a Welsh here, <laughs> yeah, let's calm down. <laughs> You ain't independent yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we'll, um, but yeah, I think what, what we've done, and especially what you guys have done, Josh and Ian and, and Tom, you've made something that really I think is going to be a, a footstep for British esports, especially in the League of Legends scene. So yeah, Dan, if you want to take it away. Oh, really? All right, okay. I guess I could talk about uh, when I, I, I first got into esports, when uh, my friend introduced League of Legends to me, and I was like, right, okay. What's this game? And he was like, alright, just, just try and play it. I was like, this game is shit. You, like, have to think about what you have to do in it. I could just play <laughs> Quake. And, like, I don't need to think about Quake. I could just kill people and, you know, get money for it. Uh, I used to play Quake 3 in some, like, small local tournaments. And I used to win quite a bit of cash out of that. Then uh, I got into League, obviously. And then we were doing things like LAN parties. Uh, like having LAN parties every four months uh, with Dundee University. And we were winning each one and keeping it in better and better. And I was like, hell, I want to do this more often. I want to start doing, like, organizing tournaments and casting and stuff like that because knowledge and whatnot. Uh, and then last year, uh, Snoopy contacted me about having, you know, the Dunge well, the UK League of Legends scene getting really big. Uh, unfortunately, things never really kicked off further than some planning for a website. Uh and some, you know, setting up a TS server for everyone, which uh, was under CLG EU at the time, I believe. Uh, thing, you know, there was talks about a lot of things they were going to do and try and improve how things were going, because CLG was having a lot of problems at the time, uh, and they ended up, you know, using a lot of their money to go to Korea. Snoopy never really got involved and then just completely ditched the idea, completely. Uh, so further down the line after meeting tons of guys to try and get something together nothing really happened uh, and then I was in Torment Gaming for a while that was like we're all diamond players all doing our own thing and trying to like get up the rank ladder and playing local tournaments and stuff where I was playing constantly against teams like Beasts and Dignitas UK <laughs> uh, uh, that's where I met people like Bolt and whatnot from and what the most you know, I played against What the Moose a few times when I was in TG, uh, and then stopped playing for them a while, and then obviously Newell came along. University, the idea that you play weekly and there's going to be some big prize at the end was like, hell, I could do this, this is really interesting. And so this all went on, and then we had all these great battles every week, you know. It was like the top four teams were just like always going at it and it was great fun but there was like there was never a competition like it was these four top teams and there was never really anyone about these four top teams that were ever going to be a threat so uh, when it came along to the whole idea of me casting which happened what four weeks ago when I had to do the call when I had to do the the preseason <laughs> it was more of a case of uh, we have no casters for tonight uh, would you like to cast? Like, we really need a caster. <laughs> uh, so I just jumped at the opportunity. I was like, yeah, why not, right? How hard can it be? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that's... I think that's how I met you, Kiernan. Mm -hmm. And that um, fateful day. Yeah, so I love triangle of... Well, love line. It's a love line. There was oh. no one else involved. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm just, it, uh, I'm just, began. by the way, guys, if you want to, I've just posted the link in the new leads section and the new team captain section, as well as the National University Sports page for our main Reddit post. If you want to upvote it, we'll get some visibility on it. That'd be good. Um, yeah, so over to Tom, I guess. How you got involved? So, yeah, I'm probably the baby of the group in terms of I've probably just arrived at the new, really, minus probably, probably a week or two later than Dan. Um, but really, I kind of started playing League many, many years ago after playing Dota and then playing a bit of Counter-Strike and realising it was really hard to actually get any good at the game, so I kind of jumped on the 
league bandwagon as it started to develop probably just before season one sort of thing and uh, I played probably from season two uh, from season one to kind of season two and 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 a bit of three I played competitively in teams and managed basically where it all changed managed to fluke it to second place at LAN at uh, I-Series I-40 46 I've got the big check oh I was I was at that I seen you guys yeah, yeah. yeah. you were 80 yeah. you were that what was it uh, ATK ATK and, yeah and, guys I remember that and we just fluked it to crap and and what really kind of jumped out at me there was that we are shit compared to VYE and <laughs> I watched that yeah, anywhere yeah. it is gonna take a lot of work so where did you where did you play where did you play on the team I, I played in I played AD carry oh. I got I got like crapped on by an Aurelia or something um, but I think we were just ecstatic <laughs> to be on the on the stage we were like hi mum you know that kind of situation we didn't care but but at that point we kind of all thought let's just try with our schoolwork because um we've got more chance there of of actually ever being a professional gamer or making any kind of money from this game properly uh, I so, it's, yeah i mean i saw you guys on stage that year and it was amazing like you all looked ecstatic i think the only player on your team that really has the chance to make it if he tried really hard would be your brother yeah um, because obviously he's really skilled, but I just remember you guys and Marshy playing Maokai every game, <laughs> and you were just like, "This is amazing!" Like we're playing against VIE on the main stage of Ice Series, and you just knew you, knew you were going to get stomped because you like because you basically you somehow got to the finals through like a Did bit I of not a say that? Yeah, in the I, it was me up for the end for you. I believe, and, and he was like, so how do you think you're going to do here? And I was pretty much like, <laughs> probably not that well, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> I, I do remember I-46, I was there as uh, Why Is Rum Gone? And we actually got seeded against VYE in the semi-finals. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. Uh, the mo it was actually probably one of the more memorable moments of I-Series, where uh, what we did was we five-man tower-dived. Um, I think it was Plasma. He was playing Timo bot lane. <laughs> Timo top lane. <laughs> so we, I mean, but he went bot lane because we're 2v1-ing, right? And we all we all thought, 2v1, so he's going to play Timo bot lane, right? Just for a joke. So we all tower-dived him, right? And we're like, oh, mission success. Five-man tower dive I was playing <laughs> GP for jokes so I teleported back top lane <laughs> little did I know that they were all waiting in the brush ready for me to TP back up <laughs> oh, we had God. a similar situation we had what five of us in the bottom brush we're like just wait they'll come they'll come so so I think a Java or a Leona rocked up and uh, just walks past this bush and we're like do we do we go? Do we go? And Will's though, our, our support just kind of wanders out and <laughs> and like gives the game away. The guy flashes away. All five of us are just standing there like, well, right, that's embarrassing. <laughs> on the, on the I remember that game because you were there for so long. Like you were sat in the rush for at least until like the three minute mark, just waiting to get the first blood. And everyone else has started their laning thinking, where the hell are these guys? <laughs> Oh, it was, oh, that was, it was the honestly one best of the best. Game. And, and the casters were stumped. They were like, "What? What, what are they doing? They're just sitting. They're just sitting in this bottom brush." To be fair, it the was, casters was... for that weren't very good either. Uh, they, uh, didn't, they didn't. They so... didn't really know what they were like. I remember the, I like hearing about them. They were like what silver players or something. I'm not gonna bad mouth them, but they <laughs> weren't very back, knowledgeable. If, if, if you think about how big League of Legends is now compared to how big League of Legends was at I46, it's grown. Ten oh, times yeah, exponentially. What was that? That and was it's gone almost a year. It's gone through the roof. Like the amount of talent you'll be coming out in terms of players in the UK and casters in the UK is only going to be increased with the amount of work that the Newell is doing, with how big League of Legends is getting. Like that, that kind of thing is just going to go through the roof. And and I forty six back then, League was big, but it wasn't the biggest game at I forty six. Oh no, no. So and now I would say League would be the biggest game at I forty six, yeah. almost certainly. I'd so, say so. But yeah. Anyway, moving on to Andy. So we look at a player's perspective. How did you Hello. get involved with the new? And I know <laughs> Card Cardiff was a bit of a late come into our, our season friendly. I think you got yeah. involved in the second one. But how did you get involved in, and, and what have your experiences been? Uh, I saw. Uh, I was browsing Reddit as I do every day, um, <laughs> and um, 
I, I randomly saw a post that we've just finished up, uh, we've just completed our first preseason friendly with Manchester taking the win or something. I said, what? There's a tournament in Britain that I don't know about? No, I'm definitely getting on that hype train. So uh, I, I basically said, okay, so it's only for university. So I went on to my gaming society and I said, okay, guys, look, I'm looking for any people that will play League of Legends. I don't care whether you're Bronze 5 or whether you're Challenger. I just, just, just come and play on my team. Uh, so I got uh, I got my best mate, uh, who you guys know is the top laner, um, and uh, three random guys who all joined my team, and then we applied, and in our very first game, we get put against Manchester. <laughs> I remember just telling my guys, guys, just just have fun. <laughs> that's all that matters. As long as you guys have fun, that's all that matters. Um, but we uh, Actually, I think we did reasonably well that game. It was uh, we we were even for a long time, and then we kind of threw it. But yeah. uh, we we uh, we we ended up coming fifth, which we were pretty chuffed with, considering uh, we we that was pretty much the first time we'd properly played with each other, and and uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Then we uh, then we practiced, came back for the the set, the third preseason friendly, um, and we did a lot better, uh, and now we're here in the Super Eight. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, my my flatmate is deciding to. <laughs> get yourself involved in this, in this <laughs> conversation. Is what that is what is this? <laughs> it's it's, it's hey, my uh, best friend and flatmate Alex, who also plays League of Legends, but is shit at it. Yeah, so, uh, Garrett, and we are in <laughs> yeah. that. Who's who's got who's got, who's got bigger guns? Made, you or your he's, flatmate? He's, he, he's he's way bigger than me. Anyway, <laughs> getting back to the serious. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> is that why you appreciate men with big balls? I'm, I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the door now. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, so yeah. I mean, I, I I saw Cardiff and I thought that you provided a really interesting insight and a bit of a, a bit of a new change up because we had so much of our tournaments dominated by just ACOG and Manchester that yeah. you, you almost could have made the prediction when we came in that ACOG and Manchester were going to make it to the final. And in fact, they did both in the second and the first pre of friendly. I think even the third. Um, the third, but. Yeah. The fact that you guys have provided more competition than they ever faced, probably in the previous year, it just kind of spoiled that we were getting somewhere. And I think that's what everyone, yeah, I think that's what everyone really enjoyed about it. Like, we, well, now that it we've was, got it, a was, solid... it, was get, it was getting a bit more competitive, you know. Yeah, now that we've got a solid roster, we're actually really excited to play them again because uh, we reckon we'll do a lot better, and we reckon a lot of other teams will do a lot better as well. Because uh, the thing about um, the thing about no disrespect to Manchester and ACOG, but they're very they're very similar in their playstyle. They're very repetitive, and once you play them enough times, you you tend to realise that they pick the very common champions. Shots uh, fired. <coughs> yeah, shots fired. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I, I but you agree. have to that that you can't doubt their skill. Is they're really good individuals, and I I personally felt the last year ACOG were were a team that could have rivaled many challenger teams just because of their synergy. They were just they were so in sync with each other. And having a chat with their mid laner, he just told me that he basically we, we've been playing for a year with each other. Petty. And yep. You just build that synergy up. I anyway, can, speaking of speaking, speaking of ACOG, I've just I've just invited Zenogra, who is the <gasps> ACOG uh, support. support. Yeah. Um, oh so hopefully he he will um, give you a bit of insight into what ACOG were like getting into the nil. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll if, if, if Sebastian on... has picked so that Seb, you picked up. Uh, yeah. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Zane. Uh, yeah, we can. We can hear you. Hey, um, so Seb, uh, like getting into the, the new, obviously ACOG have been there for a while. Um, did you enjoy the fact that people like Cardiff were coming in who were providing you with a bit more of, I don't want to be harsh to the teams that we had before, but a bit more of a challenge? Well, to be fair to uh, like all the teams that were in the annual before anyway, I mean, towards the end of last year, the competition was getting a lot closer. I mean, Imperial College was starting to cause real troubles for Manchester particularly, and we faced them, I think, once, but... Like, they kept on playing, like, wombo combo kind of stuff, and it was really hard to deal with because... I mean, this is why, like, now, I don't know if you've noticed, but... Pretty much every week, we ban Malphite. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty much just because we're sick of playing against the wombo combos. And, yeah, like... I was saying, like, Imperial mainly, but... It wasn't, like, as if it was just Imperial that was coming up. I mean, Abate came up. Um, I remember Cardiff had some... Like, we had some good games with them in scrims, actually. Well, not scrims, but, like, in ranked games, I think we bumped into them. I think maybe Swansea. Man, but no, no mention of my team. What's this all about, Zane? <laughs> we used to have rival <laughs> Dundee, man. Oh, Dundee. Do you, do you not? Do you not? <laughs> hey, whoa, 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 whoa! Do you not remember my pentakill? 
against you guys on Akali? Like, come on. Was that in the ranked games? No, that was uh, that was when we were playing in Newell. It was like a best of three, and you just like beat us two games, but we got the first game on you because I went Akali. <laughs> yeah, on you Dundee Abate. Dundee. Not Dundee Abate. No, Dundee. Just Dundee. Oh, wait, so you, wait, Abate you is the different team. No, we were QMB kids. Uh, Man, that was ages ago. I even, I even played with you guys in Carnage for a while. God, I feel like I've been forgotten. <laughs> you didn't I play with me. No, you Space know, because you, you had uh, a. You had who? A, no, I was Space Biscuit and, and from Thingy. But no. Uh, oh, Space Biscuit. Do you know, I met you at I-46, Dan. I can't believe it. I did. Oh. Wait, wait, did we meet? I, Real? Were you friends with Clown? Yeah, you, dude. Yeah, yeah. Me and him I, are I like, you. We are like, like lovers. We had a good 10 minute conversation. <laughs> did we? I, I, do you know what? I completely recognize you now. I just. That, that is <laughs> what? I, I, was, I, met, I met Clown. Um, he's the indie, pretty looking boy type person. Isn't yeah, he? he's like, like proper yeah. good looking. <laughs> Why yeah, am yeah. I saying that? You didn't realise this is going on YouTube after. Oh, <laughs> this, is yeah. Yeah. Out, yeah? this is a real love story. <laughs> this is how true love will always find its path. Yeah. <laughs> See what? You might find a video from iSeries where I'm kiddie backing on top of some 8 foot guy. <laughs> like going through iSeries on, like, on his back. There's a video of that somewhere on YouTube. Don't find it, please. <laughs> it anyway, guys, we should uh, probably move the conversation on to our next topic. Go for um, it. Talking about specifically this preseason qualification tournament, um, I just want to get everyone's opinions about how you thought it went. I mean, it was a big tournament for us. We had over 100 teams participating. The amount of planning that Ian and Josh did in going to the brackets was absolutely insane. I think every other day we had like posts in the in the Leeds um, Facebook group saying, "Well, we've come up with this new bracket idea because we've just had another 40 teams included, so we don't, our old ones out the window." What what, what do you guys think? I personally will just give my opinion from casting it. It was probably one of the most, the biggest audience I think I've ever cast to personally. We had 695 viewers at its peak, which was absolutely massive for our tournament. Um, I had really good fun as well. I mean, I got really tired towards the end, but we, we got a good five, six hours of casting in that day, and we had some really close matches. And what I really liked about it is that the matches were close. Like, I, I didn't think, feel like I was going into a game knowing who was going to win. I, I went into the game thinking any of these teams could win. Like Newcastle versus Nottingham, that was a close game. Like it was, it was to the extent that at one point Nottingham started to snowball, and that's when I went out of control. But for the most part, like when I used to watch ACOG versus, say, like LMJU Jokers, no offense to those guys, but they just, you know, they just went into the same skill level, and you just knew that in lanes they got dominated. And and with when I was watching the games and casting the games that we cast on Sunday, I no one was happy. Nothing was like that was happening. Like, there was one game, I think, where someone got absolutely crushed. Um, I can't quite remember which one it was, but I think it was the third game, or the second game, basically. Someone got absolutely crushed, and it was, it was like a 20-minute game. But apart from that, the amount of competition that the, all, all of these now universities are bringing, like, the amount of people who are, who are coming in at, at such a higher skill level than we've ever seen before is, is really entertaining and really good for our esports scene. And I think that finding this talent in Britain is, is what's going to make the esports scene good for us especially with the new because um, university sports is a big thing like, it has been a big thing in Britain for ages now that we're kind of trying to develop the esports scene a bit, I think it's only going to go further if we can keep up this momentum I what do you think was, I was, oh, sorry, yeah. what I was just going to say about on the uh, skill level what's really cool as well is it's not just high skilled players coming in but it's like highly skilled teams like a lot of similar ranked players playing on the same team at like platinum diamond level which is really quite entertaining which is awesome yeah, and to be honest, Josh, as well, the fact that you've cooked up this lower division means that bronze and silver teams are going to have feel like they're in a competition as well. I'll tell you, you that's know. probably my, my favourite bit of the whole thing, the fact that I could post, because like, um, I know we'll go into this a bit later, so I won't go into too depth, but there, I've now got so many so many individuals from Cardiff that say, oh, we want to play, but we don't think we're good enough, and I can just say, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. If you guys are all Bronze 5, you're more than welcome to come and play. And I'm sure there is another university out there that has another team of Bronze 5 that you guys can just, you know, ruin. So, you know, <laughs> come, come along and play because everybody is welcome, which is a really great thing, you know? Yeah. I think as well, as it, as it gets bigger, you're going to find that people are actually going to watch the stream a lot more um, because they can get involved in terms of, like, if you watch the LCS, you know you're never going to get there. If you watch a UK tournament and you know you could potentially be 
on the stream that everyone's watching and get some fame. And it's just it's just going to grow and grow, in my opinion. And it's incredible that you managed to get a hundred teams for this for this season. Uh, I was like gobsmacked as soon as I saw that. I thought that was incredible. So, well done to everyone. Yeah, yeah, it was really really crazy. Just unbelievable amount of we just blew up. We we blew up in a matter of weeks, and I I don't, I don't know what happened. Ian has been really good with his his, his advertising on Reddit, uh, and we've just somehow timed it right and. Everyone just, I think word of mouth spread from the teams that we had involved. We slowly got more teams as preseason friendly two. We got a little, a few more teams preseason friendly three, and then suddenly it just went bang, 100 teams. <laughs> and it just came out of nowhere. Do you know what's really helped? The UK League, Legend, League of Legends subreddit. Like that, that is actually, I think, the first time that I've seen a UK League of Legends subreddit stay and get a decent amount of viewers per day. It is, it's, it's really helped for general for advertising and getting people the information they need because now there's this source that they have. And we've tied in quite closely to that, and I think we've taken advantage of that pretty well. I think what's lovely as well is the fact that the majority of these teams, you know, they're not playing for a prize or a massive 10k prize like at Land. And that it's it's mostly for the glory, and I think that's that's something that other tournaments that don't really do, just to attract people for the sake of they want to be the best out of everyone else, which is is totally different to how things have been running so far in the UK scene kind of people have been throwing money at it and not really thinking of you know getting popular if you know mm. what I'm saying that's because we got no money to throw at it but, uh... <laughs> but, <laughs> oh yeah but I mean you're doing it in a much better way in my opinion um, if you've managed to get 100 teams in without having a big prize pool up you know that's incredible to me like, yeah, I mean it's fantastic. Cause, you know, we're out here to try and get more people, more British people involved with UK esports or esports in general, should I say? Um, you know, that's why we've designed the format with the openness at the bottom, so anybody can come and join in. And uh, what's fantastic for me is that you know, probably the vast majority of these teams, like eighty, ninety percent of them, are just brand new teams that have never really competed before in a tournament. And you know, if we can just give this, you know small bite of the apple and just give people a little taste of you know what esports is about you know potentially it might inspire somebody to go on to do something you know a lot better and you know, stick at it and hopefully it'll inspire a lot of people just to generally get involved with you know the smaller esports tournaments and just playing in teams in general and that's what we're um, trying to achieve i'll tell you something that's that's really cool for like an on an individual because i've 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 been playing games since I was like 10 years old um, and I've always wanted to do it professionally and I've never really been that good um, so to have something like this and to actually get my name because I mean like I know now I, I know Excoundrel loves to talk about me which I much appreciate um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's the fact that I got to play against for a start in my very first game I got to play against a Diamond 1 mid laner named Tundra who was an ex, uh, ex semi-professional um, and then in my second game, I got to play against the YouTube celebrity named What the Moose. Uh, so I mean, the fact that um, players get the chance to play against other people who are well known is a really great opportunity, especially because you get to see how you compare against everyone else. And you know what? Another thing is that because a lot of the young UK League of Legends pro players, so the Dignitas Jungler, everyone that's in that kind of uh, level of competitive play, it. It's crazy that people who are now bronze and silver are playing with them, playing against them, just because of the, how the, the way teams match up in, in the null. And people would never have got that opportunity before. And you, you yeah. just kind of see, and it kind of like highlights the skill of some of the UK players, some of the people who probably wouldn't have even known about them beforehand. Uh, it, it's just crazy to think that our tournament can involve those kind of people on a casual and front, front, line friendly level. It, it's, it's really good. Yeah. And um, I mean, going on from that guys um, what do you think the Newell's going to do in particular for British esports because at the moment I would say it's one of the biggest British only tournament running sort of I, what's the word company type group there is you know uh, and I think if we keep going I think we can really put a foothold on boosting the esports scene as, as a really popular and um, less taboo subject in the UK because at the moment computer esports in, in general is something that the UK just doesn't have in its culture a lot of people are Xbox orientated and 
they play a lot of Call of Duty, they play a lot of FIFA, and, and that's the kind of gaming that's associated with the UK. Computer esports is growing though, and League of Legends especially is getting bigger and bigger. And the fact that we have this tournament that's involving so many universities from across the country, so many players, you know, think about it, we had a hundred and something teams, each of those teams had a minimum of five members, that's 500, and then there's subs and everything, and, you know, that's, that's a lot of people for just a UK tournament. I, and I think if we keep going, you, we're going to have it grow even more and more because you, League is getting more popular. And I think League will become more popular in the UK. And I think with that, we'll become more popular in the oh. UK. I'm saying on sort of, uh, on the, you know, uh, first year freshers, uh, uni pages, sort of those, you're actually seeing people posting stuff like, do you, anyone play Dota here? Add me in game name, etc. And people aren't like, hiding the fact that they're fully blown geeks and they enjoy playing games anymore which is is pretty great it means that i don't have to hide away so much um but like in general like, like you say just just to have kind of potentially like varsity things kind of going on between universities and and just actually advertise the fact that people play games and enjoy them together and not be embarrassed about it it being almost going to be brought up to a parallel with potentially some sports within the university I think that's great Yeah. Um, you know it's just one of those things that I remember back when I was about I don't know uh, 11 years old and I was we just hit high school and uh, if you got I don't know if anybody seen you interested in games it was like you were some kind of I don't know infested weirdo because you <laughs> automatically were just not normal. Uh, I was brought up with my mom, and my mom was like, yeah, you shouldn't play games. Games are bad for you, and they make you weird and shit, and you won't be socially, you know, normal. And nowadays, like, as you said, well, it's rivaling almost any other popular activity these days, and we're actually allowed to open up about our own genuine interests rather than hiding them away. I mean, I never told anybody in high school that I was into games. I never met my first ever proper friend who had in the same interests as me until I was in first year of university. I was like 18 years old. <laughs> you know, and that's ridiculous if you think about it in that sense. I, up until I was 18, I never met a single person who had the same interests as me. When it came I, to I, was the, I was the very much the same. In high school, I was is a very much you classic geek. And and I just never told anyone that I played World of Warcraft because I knew that it would it would alienate me because it was considered weird. You know, people who play games were supposed to be weird. They were these sort of reclusy hideaway guys who spent their time in the library. Um, and it wasn't until I left for university that actually I met a load of people that do play this kind of thing. And then it becomes it became more and more popular. And I started finding out that people who I never thought would have played games actually played them, but didn't had were in the same boat as me. They just didn't want to tell anyone because they thought it would be weird. I had people in high school that were considered the jocks, kind of saying, oh, Kieran, I heard you used to play World of Warcraft. Do you still play? Because I'm playing on such and such server. And I was like, well, no, I don't, but really weird, because if you played it during high school, so did I. Um, and it, you, you just find that it, this kind of thing is is um, just growing, and, and, and computer esports is becoming less, and, less of a taboo subject in, in social culture. Before now, I would never have told my girlfriend that I'd, I was into League, but my girlfriend who has no interest in esports all the computers whatsoever and she knows that I cast this and knows that I play League of Legends and it's quite a big part of my life and, and she's okay with it. I would never have said that before about a year ago and I think the growth of Riot in League of Legends in general is is just something that's aided that because it's it's something that people do now and it's not considered weird. Definitely. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing Riot has, well, Riot and more of the community has actually become more mature. Ha 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 ha. Uh, you'll get Twitch chat. No. <laughs> uh, like, the end, I think the entire world has become more accepting of people enjoying things that's, that's their own. Even if we even branch down, like, homosexuality. Think of homosexuality 20 years ago. <laughs> like, no one really came out. Nowadays, like, Multicolored people, you know. There's there's people walking down the streets, guys holding hands, girls kissing in the street together. You know, these thin things happen, and now nerds are able to talk about their favorite sport in a bar. Like we are know? the modern day homosexuals. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I like the parallel. <laughs> no, you think about it this way. Like, 
I I am um, I have run a, a, an esports society for the Dundee uni for Dundee like not even just one university it's for the entire city. Doesn't matter if you're a student. It doesn't matter if you're unemployed or if you're you know you work fifty hours a week in some crazy ass office. If you enjoy games, you come you can come have a drink with us. You know you can we can go out clubbing or even just sit at home and playing games. We can do anything and go for meals and shit and everyone just enjoys it. You couldn't be able to do that so long ago because nobody kind of came out about this stuff. But nowadays, yeah. we can all do it. So you need to uh, uh, coin a phrase for coming out of the closet for gamers. There needs to be a phrase. <laughs> Josh can work on this. We can brainstorm it this week and get back to you. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Josh, Josh will bring up a uh, thirty-minute section I'm meeting just to figure out a uh, a phrase for this. <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll need a we'll need a planning and then moving into uh, executing and then uh, writing a blog about it. And we need to put it through the, the little through the little Excel spreadsheet just so we get it all right. And then <laughs> and you guys, better. you guys could call it meet. You guys could call it meeting on the motherboard. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, lovely. <laughs> Okay, what what's next, Scoundrel? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, specifically, I want to talk about the Super Eight and, and what we think from the top eight seeds in the team because there's three, it's eight, well, six of the eight that I think are really, really decent, and I think they will will have tough six? competition. Six. Six. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's saying, Ooh. It's all right. Let's say it's Cardiff and Acog are one of my six, two of my six. <laughs> But I, I think there's going to be some really tough competition in, in that Super 8. And I think that Manchester and ACOG are going to have a tougher time than they have done in the past. In fact, I don't even think... No offence to ACOG and Manchester. I just don't think they are the strongest team there now anymore. No. And I, I think... Cardiff Hype Train, cough. <laughs> <laughs> Cardiff Hype Train all the way. You're not, you're not playing your Zach Jungle, so I'm not as interested. <laughs> but um, I think there's going to be really tough competition there this year. And I, I think even... Throughout the year, I think we'll see some changes in that Super Eight because of the way we're structuring the tournament and because of the way the Open Division works. I think you guys are going to have to fight to stay up there, and it's going to be very LCS-like. Each match is going to count, and I think you guys are going to put serious think thoughts into your tactics, into the way you approach the games, and just generally the practice schedules that you have for them. Obviously, it's not taking it super serial, but like. I think it's going to be tough, and I think you're not going to have a cakewalk. Like a Aiken and Manchester are not going to have a cakewalk this year. I, th I think as well is like there's a lot that we can't base off last weekend because I think a lot of the teams that were participating were really surprised at how good some of the teams were. There, there yeah. people you know stacked with diamond one players, and I think they were kind of expecting to come in and roll it, um, and they just didn't. Um, and and so I think they're all going to step up their games. And it's going to be really interesting, which I will just be great. To say um, that when <laughs> when Cardiff played against uh, what the Mooses team, we uh, we we genuinely thought we were going to lose. Um, we thought we're, we're going to get we're going to lose it during the laning phase because um, that's that's where we feel our weakest point is, just being outplayed on an individual level. Um, and then Ocherm came in with the carry, <laughs> and, and, and we were My basically guy. just we were basically all game just said Ocherm is a god. <laughs> um, but uh, it was honestly that was that was possibly one of the best moments I, I say of our lives, but like of our League of Legends career, because to be able to know that on an individual level and in like in terms of solo queue they had a lot stronger team, but it felt like our synergy was. The, what sort of helped us win overall? That's that was like a really good feeling. Tell me that... how much of an adrenaline rush that is, because I know how good, how big an adrenaline rush you get. It was. It, it was. Just oh, the crap honestly, out of it. when 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 I got first blood onto what the moose, right? They told me to mute my mic because I wouldn't stop screaming. It was awful. I was going to expand on that game actually, and uh, I said to Kieran, we're on to the stream actually to everybody, and I go, "Is I'm going to call right now, Oat Germ, right? I played against him last season, and he was a dick. You want to know why? Because he camps his shit out of mid lane. <laughs> so see what the moose, see picking out Victor pick. He's an, he's like, I'm going to say he's an idiot because he isn't an idiot, right? Everyone he's knows that what the moose is a good player, right? Uh, I don't think he's as strong as what people can make him out to be, but he is still, a, you know, a good player. I was impressed. Uh, uh, Victor. Now, when you have someone like Jarvin and someone who likes to camp mid lane as Oatgerm does, and he told me about that very a lot, and he showed me a lot of this, because uh, I felt the pain a long time ago. Uh, 
I was like, right, first blood's gonna go straight on to Cardiff, I bet you any money. <laughs> Kieran is like, alright, okay, I can see this. Over and over again, Victor, no escape, boom, dead, gank, dead, first blood. And I was like, okay, so how's this game gonna go from there? And just Victor, like, if Victor doesn't get ahead, it kinda feels a bit shaky. Yeah, you're, his, uh, you're, you're definitely right. Um, I don't know if we wanna talk about, I don't know, what, what would you like to talk about, Scoundrel? What's this? Uh, do you want us to keep talking about? Do you want us to keep talking about the game, or is there a specific topic you'd like us to talk about? No, honestly, guys, this is just a place for you to express your thoughts about how you think you're going to do in the coming season, specifically in the Super Eight. Like, what do you think the matchups are going to be like between you and Manchester, right. you and ACOG, you and um, right. the Imperial side, the Swag Vicious, and all that kind of because all of them looked really strong. All right. Well, um, from like Cardiff's perspective, we think that the games are going to be a lot. We're really looking forward because we play better against teams that we know. Um, just because we're, we're, we, we like to think that we're good at coming up with strategies and a lot of cheese. Like, I've already talked to you about some of my picks that I plan on bringing out. Um, and uh, it's, it, we like to come up with strategies, but when you play someone for the first time, it's really uncomfortable. And, and I think, as you said, it threw a lot of teams off because like, um, I think that the team... Uh, going back to this game against what the moose they didn't ban zed and they probably didn't expect someone to be able you know someone like me to be able to play zed at a decent level and i think that caught them by surprise somewhat and the vladimir pick probably caught them by surprise as well and that probably happened in so many games like i was amazed that imperial got knocked out by their b team i have no idea how that happened but what well the they were thing scarred of, for life. Yeah, yeah. The thing, about, the, thing about the, the thing about the two Imperial teams is that the first Imperial team was seeded like you were based on the previous tournaments. Yeah. The second Imperial team was seeded based on their solo queue yeah. elos. So actually, even though they were the 16th seed in our upper bracket, um, it ended up that they were actually on a slightly higher skill level than the Imperial team beforehand because the Imperial team were good, but they're, actually their B team were better. And right, the, B team wow. did re the, the B team did really well all the way through the tournament. Um, and that's why they're now qualified for the Super 8, because they were just that good. And I, th I think that the A team was there because they were the first Imperial team, not necessarily right. because they were the best Imperial team. I see, yeah. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. But we're uh, on, like, in terms of the Super 8, we reckon it'll be good. Like, we're really excited about being able to play someone who's, you know, at a similar skill level or even better skill level than we are on a weekly basis and come up with strats to cream those noobs. I want to. I want to. I want to call this out, right? I uh, in against ACOG. I have a feeling that you'll do well mid lane. Okay, I think mid lane and jungler combo. I think Cardiff has the advantage, like more so than ACOG. Uh, I don't know if Zani would agree on that. Uh, he he's obviously biased towards this, but <laughs> ACOG's ACOG's bot lane is probably the strongest bot lane. Right oh now. yeah. I would, say, is a beast. I would say Defunct is a beast. I would say Rods and Zani are the best bot lane that Newell have possibly right now. Because I thought, Rods, I Rods, thought, Rods is one of the most impressive AD carries in the tournament. Um, I think I used to think that Hobbit on Manchester was probably one of the better ones, but obviously he's stopped playing to an extent now. But Rods is... I've seen his Vayne play. I've seen his, his uh, Kaelin play. They're, they're really top level. and. That, that guy is very good, and, and Zani, when he plays as Zyra, is just out of this world. So that that's it, that was a very strong bot lane in the last three tournaments. Yeah, playing with uh, playing with Rods, Zani, and playing against them, I can tell you that their bot lane's always been the problem. Their mid lane has always been weaker comparatively than other mids. Not to say that he's a, that he's weaker now, because he has stepped up his game hugely. I know Ped wasn't as good before, but he is now good now. Uh, I don't know what the, what the situation is with top lane because I still don't know who your top lane is currently. Well, actually, ACOG are having problems right now because um, one of their players left, and that, well, he now didn't they, leave they per se. It's is just... this the one I think you're talking about? Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, no, right. yeah. this is um, anyway. We they needed to get a new top laner in, so they had a new top laner for the Manchester and ACOG best of three on Sunday. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, he didn't quite live up to the expectations, or so I heard. So I think Ped's actually now moving to the top lane, and they're looking for a new mid laner. Uh, when I well, was... this is like, oh sorry, on your well, just like, I want to pull back a bit to defend Pete a little. Um, Pete isn't really a mid laner. I mean, like he always says that he wants to go back to top lane because that's his primary role. That's what he plays in solo queue all the time. He's got a really strong top champion pool, 
and it's not as if his mid pool is bad, but his top pool I think is probably better. And in terms of how he plays top lane as well, I think he's more reliable. He's not the person that will, like if you see him in how we play across all of the NUL tournaments, Pete doesn't tend to lose lane, and if he does, it's not horrifically. There's very few instances, I think. Like, I think there was maybe one game or two where Manchester, um, Manchester's Mr. TDs, like, got a kill or two on Fizz, and then it's hard to stop him from, you know, getting more kills in mid. But, like, on his own, he tends to always hold up, and he tends to always be very solid in terms of his actual result. So, like, I think if we could just find probably, I'd say, an aggressive mid laner, someone that could be a bit more edgy, and then have a safe top, so we know that top's never going to get... Because, I mean, I, I wasn't playing this Sunday, so I actually don't really know the full extent of what happened. I was just told that top got pushed in, and then we basically just lost top, top tower, and from top being lost, we lost everything else. So I'm not really sure of the strength of our new top laner. We haven't really practiced it with him either. I mean, I haven't been able to get on for the last two weeks either, so... We definitely need to practice. <laughs> that is our main weakness at the minute, I think, is practice. But, I mean... Uh, as well, in terms of um, what you're saying about this year being probably a lot harder. And like I said, it's not as if last year it wasn't getting difficult, and we kind of expected that it was going to be a level above this year, because, I mean, if you're saying that Imperial's second team are better than their first team, it was their first team I was talking about originally, so if their first team can almost beat what was the previous top two seeds, and their new team's better, I'm just looking forward to that. I want some challenges. Like, I don't want to have easy runs through the brackets. It's always fun to like, you know, have one week where you just crush through, but then the next week you get knocked out in the first round. And you just go, what, what, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the kind of thing that I'm really looking forward to because I think all of the Super Eight are going to take it to a serious extent. I think they're going to really bring out as many new tactics as they can. I'm really looking forward to seeing how British esports, especially our university teams, think up new ways to play because it's all very well and good copying the pro scene meta, because that's a good way of going about getting wins, but it would be really interesting to see anything innovative, innovative comes up, because even though I think I cast a game where ACOG played a Cassiopeia Teemo bot lane, and even though that was a little bit troll, <laughs> it was it was, it was was troll no, to right. the extent, it was troll to the extent that it was actually really bloody good. Because the thing is, it wasn't trolling, like, pe like people criticised us for that game for trolling. Yeah, okay, we didn't pick the strongest picks in the entire game. But Timo Casio is a very viable lane combo. It, it works theoretically. <laughs> and you can do it like we weren't gonna do it as Twitch Casio, but Twitch is a really strong AD carry. And it still works that way by the way. Like you can have um Casio as support instead. And she works pretty well as a support, like relatively, in terms of the semi non viable supports going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she works relatively okay. But like yeah, like Timo Cast works pretty fine. I mean you've got a decent amount of control, you've got the blind to stop people like I think who were we against? Were we against an Ash? I, I, thought, you against a, yeah, I thought you were against a Caitlyn, actually. Yeah, I think it's okay. a Caitlyn. Either way, someone who's predominantly auto-attack based. <laughs> it's not like an Ezreal, right? Who's going to like you know have other abilities to do damage. Um, so yeah, like, it's not as if like, we were horrendously trolling with that. It's a pretty legit lane. And it's quite powerful, especially if you get an early game advantage. I mean, we I mean, kind you of... Did, you, 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 got, you got an early game advantage. It is a bit of a cheese lane. It's like sticking Tarek and Leona in the bottom lane. It's, you, if, yeah. you can get, if you can get the early kills, you'll snowball that lane out of control. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing that I like to see. I mean, even though it was a bit out of the box and people thought it was a bit trolly, it was actually quite interesting to cast because it's, it's something you don't see every day. And that's what I really enjoyed about it. I like seeing that something that you don't see every day. The um, second game, you can criticize for trolling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's... That was a bit crazy. It was a bike to cast. We were trying to get excited and we were like, yeah, this is fantastic. Um, I feel sorry they've just been caught with their pants down and that's just about all we could say. Um, it's like, I, I don't know if like you figured it out, but we have not practiced double jungle Tarek and I don't oh know my. what else we've played before. You weren't alone for a second. Tarek to be Sion or something like that. I just want to throw out there, right, that... A while back, Cardiff actually tried a double jungle strat that worked really, 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 really well. But it requires so many factors to fall into place that it's just like... It, you basically have to have the perfect game for it to work. If and also you need the perfect champions. Like, if you have counter jungle-esque champions, like... If you play, like, say, Shivan and Nunu, it can work. Yeah, 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 yeah. But not the way we played it, because Tarek can't counter jungle and... <laughs> <can't> counter -jungle. <laughs> this is what I'm laying down to anyone. <laughs> If anyone manages to win, like a, a season split, uh, 
after the three weeks your promotion series using just the Blitz Stars jungle, I will buy the people that play it uh, Alistair skin and the Blitzcrank skin, okay? <laughs> so Challenge that's, no. That's how it's gonna work. Well, I just you can win it have, in the I, Super 8. So I'll, I'll, th I'll throw down, I'll throw down this, right? If anyone legitimately picks Teemo and wins a game, like that Teemo bounty which got taken down, in the null, I'll buy them whatever skin they want in the game. Challenge accepted! <laughs> really? Challenge even, accepted. even if it's why, a legendary. And not, not, the ult not, not the ultimate Ezreal one, though, it's too much, but a legendary skin is as far as I'll go. My, my team have just sent me about 10 pings going, no, 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 <laughs> and no. I'm like, no. guys, Teemo's viable, it is. I, I can make it work, I'm sure. Well, if we move and on if, with the meta... And if, and if you win a Teemo jungle game, I'll buy you two skins. <laughs> <laughs> what about support Teemo? No, no, support Teemo is too, too semi-viable, not having <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I actually lost a platinum game in rank today with who's someone who played Teemo support. <laughs> it was grim. Was he on the Moving winning on team or the meta. losing team? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to get some final words from Josh about... Um, well, how he thinks the news is going to go from here, and how, just generally how he feels about how it's all exploded. First off, a shout out to Manchester Penguins, who I've seen first in Facebook, wanting a shout out. Um, seems to be a really strong showing from Manchester uh, in the Super 8 this season, so that's going to be really interesting. Both from uh, University of and Met, so hopefully a bit of rivalry going off there, that would be cool. But yeah, I mean, it's the sort of like response we've had so far has been absolutely out of this world. I mean, I haven't slept properly since Thursday because we've just been processing that many teams and so on, that many problems that uh, it's just, just going ballistic and uh, this is fantastic. This is what we want. Uh, I would like some sleep at some point, but, um, you know, it's really good. So, we just want to get more teams involved. You know, like I said, we've specifically designed the system so more teams can get involved at any point and uh, you know, hopefully we'll see some more challenges like I so showed Daniel Vouch that uh, you know, we saw a strong showings from Dundee teams halfway through last season and went on to do great things so we, uh, we want more things like that hopefully um, you know, we, we want more people tuning in and you know just sort of back in the UK esports scene hopefully and um, fingers crossed that we can we can pull something quite I don't know impressive or um, something to look forward to for the end of the season uh, but it's early days yet so uh, <laughs> can't give too much away but yeah hopefully we get something um, some sort of uh, sending off should you like that people will uh, enjoy and want to get involved with right well um, we've covered everything about the null that I wanted to talk about so just moving on to League of Legends in general, because this is going to be the good stuff. We'll start talking about League. Um, I wanted to touch on the mid lane right now, because recently Riot have expressed that they don't like the way that the Assassin meta is going right now. And I'm talking about the fact that there are basically four to five mid picks that are either banned or picked every game. And I know some unconventional things do come out, but I'm talking about Cassidy, Fizz, Zed, um, someone else help me out here. Uh, Le Le Blanc, uh, LeBlanc Canary and, uh, and LeBlanc's to an extent not Ariana. a problem. LeBlanc's <laughs> no, not a problem. Okay. But, but Touch her and I die. I'm just saying, I, Riot have expressed that there's going to be changes to Ari coming and there's going to be changes to casting coming. And they're, they're not liking the way that this almost no risk assassin meta is coming out. Because if you play Zed, if you play Cassadin, there's easy ways to completely burst down a champion with almost no risk involved for you. I mean, Obviously, you do commit to an extent when you're going with Cassidy and Zed, but you have escape mechanisms, which makes it very easy when you get ahead to get in, do the damage, and get out with almost nothing to persuade you not to do that. I mean, if you have a Cassidy who's fed, he can jump over a wall, one shot your AD carry, sit around and take a bit of damage, and then rift walk away. What do you guys think about this assassin meta, and do you, do you enjoy it? Because is it... Is it the right way for the mid lane to go at the moment? Because it's moved away from very much a utility mid lane to an assassin mid lane. So is I don't it okay if I, if I jump in here, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Um, so in terms of like the, 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 the thing about those specific picks is that um, they seem to... 
they kind of, as you rightly said, they get free escapes for very little risk. So if you think of someone like Katarina or Akali or Diana, they rely on quite specific things. So Katarina, if she jumps in, she needs the resets to then get back out again. So there's your risk. Akali, if she gets the kill, that gives her a reset and she's got a stealth, which is timed, so she's got that risk. Whereas somebody like Fizz gets a pretty much free escape. Same with Ari, she gets three effectively flashes. Same with Cassidy, and that's why they're considered quite strong at the moment, just because, as you've rightly said, they can go in, kill your target, and then get out risk-free. So um, that's why they're really highly contested. Uh, and the, there's, yeah, so I'd say that that's the biggest problem with them at the moment. So if, I'd either say to, to fix the problem would be to either reduce, to increase the risk, so, for example, Cassidy works in a very similar reset manner. So, for him to be able to riff walk out, he needs to get a kill or something. Um, uh, and a very similar to Ari. She either, I don't know if it's worth nerfing the damage or whether it's worth reducing the mobility that you should target. But it's, it's the fact that they get, your, as you've rightly said, it's this, it's this idea of no risk. They can go in, get the kill, get out, and they don't need, any, they don't need anything like Akali or Katarina or Diana would. Yeah, well, what's, um, what's been said about Ari is that maybe her damage will be reduced, but if you charm the target, damage against the charmed target will be increased. And that's the risk there. You've got to hit the skill shot to get the damage. Um, very tentative red posts at the moment. So there's, there's no uh, complete uh, confirmation about that kind of thing. But, sorry, I, yeah, so, but that's, that's what's been said. But, but with Cassadin, that's almost a complete kit change if you wanted to impl implement something like that. And, and, and I don't see Cassadin getting a rework. The only thing I can see for Cassadin is making him less snowboardy. But the way that works, I just don't know. Uh, if I I'd suggest for, the, oh, for Cassadin, sorry, um, to reduce the range on the ultimate rather than, rather than reduce the cooldowns and that, um, reduce that range and, and make it so he can't get on top of the AD carry as well with that ultimate, because that's a problem at the minute, he can jump right on top where, where his burst comes from. If you were forced to really kind of flash ultimate in order to get the assassination, then there's that risk element again, because at the minute, his jump's very, very large, you know, it's huge. Yeah, it's a longer range than flash at the moment, and he gets yeah. it every seven to eight seconds. You know, it's 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 something that it makes him a very strong mid lane. Obviously, he's got the weak early phase, um, but the problem is that that it, you're completely reliant on your jungler prioritizing that lane to shut him down. And in which case, the problem for the junglers at the moment is it's that's that's not the only lane you can camp anymore. I know Oatgen would disagree, but it's. Mid lane sometimes by camping it you detriment your game because you leave top lane exposed, you leave bot lane exposed, and obviously as a jungler and everyone who knows who plays jungle that, that you can't camp one lane. And those people say, you know, in solo queue people will say, right, why is the jungle not ganking me? Well, I have to gank everywhere else. You know, I have to be across. I am there to aid my entire team. I can't babysit someone and just because there is the potential to snowball there. And that's the thing that Riot. I think has a problem with the fact that you have to sit a Cassidy in pre six in order to get any sort of give him any sort of disadvantage. Same with the Zed because once Zed gets six, he's he's devastating. And, and if you both, if Zed Zed goes even in a lane with someone, it's almost certain, especially if they're a squishy target, that, that if he plays right, which most good Zed players will, he, they will get the kill. And it's just difficult I think in this in this current state for a jungler to sit on a mid lane. Another way to look at it would be to to nerf his base stats, nerf his health, uh, his health, his mana regen, and and actually make it viable that a mid laner can put some real aggression onto him early and force him out of lane properly, rather than kind of him miss. You usually probably get a 10, 20 CS lead on casting, but that really doesn't matter. You know, as you say, it it, it doesn't rely. Um, that heavily on getting early farm, he can as soon as he gets that six, he can just start farming up on his own accord, sort of thing. Well, what you'll see X Peke do on Caston is he will literally just use his um, W, which is obviously his magic damage increase on a melee attack, to farm under turret, which is actually quite a potent way of farming on Caston. Because obviously, if you leave a melee minion to take two tower hits, you can just hit it once with your W and get the minion kill. Mm -hmm. And if and Kast he's always said, if I go behind on farm pre six on Caston, it doesn't matter to me. Because I know that post six, I have much more utility than most other mid laners. The the main thing for me is just not dying pre six and not giving away kills, and that's something that that 
makes casting almost an instant ban these days. I right, think I... about um. Oh, carry on, space. You haven't said oh, a word. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I I want to bring it back to well, as Cassidy is part of this. But uh, if we go back to the old assassin meta, we're talking like like start of season two when Talon was viable. Right? You remember when Talon came out and his like his regen was insane and shit, and his damage was through the roof. But people, the thing with Talon and Akali was that they had the biggest amount of counterplay, and the thing that counterplay dumb was uh, an item that cost 125 gold. You could literally pop that down and that's it, no escapes, there's nothing you can do, like, that's you, you're, you're screwed. Uh, Akali is based completely on her shroud. If Akali is revealed within her shroud, she can be shut down. Uh, she can't jump away unless it's to another person or a minion. Uh, Cassidy has, obviously, as you were saying, free roam. He can jump anywhere he wants, go and go over walls. He can, he can jump anywhere he feels like it. Uh, Diana, however, obviously is the same like a Kali, and that's how Diana is now a balanced champion because she, she, she has to uh, sacrifice her gap closer to get kills, and she gets mm. punished. If she if she doesn't kill someone or she double gap closes for more damage, she's instantly punished for that if she doesn't kill the target. Same way Akali, a tal Talon, Talon doesn't even have the damage half the time to kill someone unless he's helped beforehand or unless the person's dumb. As you'll see in there, and when I used to play Talon in NGL, uh, it would actually take a lot to just kill someone mid lane. Uh, and Talon's seen as a counter to Cassidy, but Cassidy's beat Talon nowadays. Mm. But why would that be? Uh, you need to look at it from mechanic points of view. Talon has a silence. He has a slow, which has rake damage, which are all physical, by the way. He has a bleed. Uh, it's an amplified auto attack. Uh, that's physical damage as well. And he has his ult, which is physical damage. Still doesn't do damage against Castan because Castan can start Doran Shield. And he doesn't need to go into melee or creeps because his null sphere is on a tiny cooldown and he can farm with it. Uh, before before the assassin, the current assassin meta, and we're talking end of season 2, when Karthus, I don't know if you just remember from season 2 world finals, Cassidy was picture banned almost every game. Yeah. And the games he picked, who was picked up, he has like an 80% win rate in. In the, in the finals, TPA versus... Help me out here. Azubu. Azubu. Azubu Frost. Azubu Frost. Kasten was picked twice, okay? And he was picked by either side, and they won both games purely because of Karthus. And, but he had counterplay to him even then, and he's never been touched since then. But coming in this current meta, it's, it's unfair in how uh, Morello, I won't quote it directly, but he says there is absolutely no counterplay to a person who can jump over a wall, instant kill someone with a DFG, and then jump back over. It's not fair well, yeah, on a it. champion. You're right. This just comes back to the whole thing that me and Excoundra were saying about the no risk thing, you know? There's just, there's, there's, as you, you're, the best point you made was with Akali and the, 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 the pink ward, you know? I mean, like, that's, that's just instant counterplay right there. And how, how do you counterplay Cassidy? I mean, the, the best thing I, I can think of, and what I think a lot of pros have thought of, is you send your 2v1 mid lane to try and snowball the early game as fast as humanly possible. Because you take that mid tower, and then you just pressure, 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 so yep. you never let Cassidy get to the point that he's terrifying. Yeah. And that's pretty much the only way to counterplay Cassidy. But if he somehow survives the laning phase, then it, it was pointless anyway, and you're going to lose the late game just because of how well he scales. Well, uh, one of the questions we had were, at what point, at what patch was it that this all changed? That, uh, I mean, there was no noticeable buffs um, to these champions as such, and and at what point did the meta change for 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 them to take such, you know, dominance? Um, was it a nerf on on some other uh, players' parts? Was it a nerf on the jungle? Was it the jungle change? You know, what do you guys think? I, I personally, I'm going to throw out here, I think this kind of thing started evolving from when Seeker's Arm Guard came in and then when e early Magic Resist and Chalice became a more useful item. Yes. And I think it's so easy for mid-champions now to get defensive items that actually give them quite a boost defensively as well. 
because obviously picking up Chalice of Harmony gives you that magic resist, but also gives you the one percent mana regeneration per per one percent missing, and then you also have Seeker's Arm Guard, which gives you thirty AP and a crap ton of armor. So people can pick that kind of thing up and feel fairly safe in that mid lane. Especially, I think it's why Talons died out in mid lane a hell of a lot because you can now start cloth five pot in the mid lane and it build it into something that actually becomes one of your core items anyway. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's 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 something like. The, it, Right now, there are so many defensive options for mid laners to take early on, which actually benefit them incredibly going into their mid and late game builds. And, and that's why things people like Castin can go in and actually feel fairly safe, especially with the introduction of the Flask. The Flask is one of the biggest items that a lot of mid laners will pick up if they think they're going to take a lot of poke. Because obviously you can't build early magic resist in a mid lane because you, you waste too much of your gold. But the Flask is something that you can pick up and just sustain through a uh, fairly decent amount of poke and I think it's why it's made these early game champions like Kastin who had this particularly weak early game a lot safer to pick now because there's just so many barriers to survive this early harass. I, I agree to an extent. Um, I think it all started personally when when the when the AD mid sort of meta, do you remember the good old days of Black Cleaver Warmogs? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, those days when those sort of died out because everyone was like, well, what do we play mid now? And then people started going back to things like Ari, and they were like, oh, this is kind of fun. And because Ari suddenly became popular, a common counterpick to Ari was something like Cassadin. And everyone was like, oh, okay, Cassadin's quite a good pick into Ari. Let's take Cassadin. And, and so people sort of developed this thing. But I think it really changed when Fizz got oh, his E bug e. fixed. Oh. Yeah, they, they, they fixed, I think it was 3.8 or something. I don't know yeah. which patch it was, but the f I remember Lemon Dogs played it. That, they were the changers, right? And basically it got changed, and someone from Lemon Dogs, the mid laner Nuke Duck, he said, if they ever fix Fizz's E, I'll play him competitively. And the first patch he gets fixed, they played him competitively. And the moment Fizz came out, right, like this whole idea of like the assassin meta just sort of exploded. So personally, I would say it was all thanks to Fizz. You can blame Fizz. Yeah. Well, I, 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 want to I want to use this to lead into our next point because I think that these high, mobili high mobility mid laners have come about because of the way that mobility is important in the terms of global objectives now. And I think the fact that rotations now are so important, having a high mobility mid laner makes it a lot easier to make rotations and a lot easier to push objectives as a grouped, grouped team members. So having high mobility mid laners means you can go bot, get a double kill, push the tower. And that's a global objective and a kill for your team because you have the mobility to do that. And I think that that's something that's evolved into the current meta and that's why the Koreans do so well is because they do that. They're high mo highly mobile as a team and they push towers, they take global objectives Absolutely. and they snowball off the global goal that you get. And that's going to bring me into my next point. Um, this current meta and the way that most people are winning games right now in the pro scene is by snowballing global objectives. You can't deny that. That is exactly how SKT1 won most of their games at Worlds. They just snowballed all of the global objectives that they could, and they made brilliant rotations. And Chan China, OMG are a prime example of that as well. Yeah, and so, do you think that this is a good meta for League of Legends to be in at the moment? Because I don't enjoy it. Because right no, now, I agree. Bring back <laughs> Fortify. Bring <Yeah>. back Fortify. <laughs> because, because right now, taking towers is one of the biggest ways to win a game and this global objective snowball that you have once you're a, a moderately far in the lead because of it there's almost no way a team can come back and you'll often find that if it, you know the, the, the statistics that Spelsy, Spelsy posted on um, Leagueopedia that 70% of the teams who, who took first blood at League of Legends in the team won 85% of the people who took the first tower won the game 100% of the people who took the first inhibitor won the game does this, think, does this make you think that maybe League of Legends needs to be sort of changed to an extent that it take, losing these objectives will give you an advantage, but not an advantage that will win you the game? Do, do, do we need to go more Dota 2 style? I know a lot of people will hiss and boo at this, but do we need to go more Dota 2 style where actually teamfight mechanics can come back into it and a really great teamfight can turn it around enough to the, to the point that uh, actually you can get back in the game? Because the difference between Dota 2 and League is you lose gold when you die on Dota 2. That's why a great team fight can win your team back a lot of objectives, and the, and the, the death timers are a lot longer. And if you want to get back in, you have to buy your way back in. In league, there's no there's no penalty for dying, and global objectives just allow your team to completely snowball. And almost certainly, if you're 5k goal behind at 20 minutes because of the global objectives taken, 
you, there's, there's almost no way you can get back into the game unless you're playing for the late game. Uh, I think it's one of those questions where the answer is it depends on what your goals are. I mean, if League as a scene is going, well, if Riot particularly are wanting to move the game towards being more fun for the players, then obviously you want to you want to be able to bring in that uh, factor of being able to make a really easy comeback by winning, you know, well, not an easy comeback, but starting up a comeback by winning a team fight where you weren't so badly behind. Um, but from a viewing aspect, which is really what Riot are going for, having this meta where if you get behind, you're behind and you stay behind, it's a lot more, I think, I think it's much better from a viewing perspective because A, it means matches are a lot quicker. It means that if the team's ahead and they're obviously stomping, the game's just going to end flat out in 25 minutes probably or 30 minutes. And we saw that a lot at LCS particularly. But it also means that if there is a comeback, from a viewing perspective, that is massive. I mean, if you remember back when, uh, who was it? CLGU. Uh, CLGU, <laughs> yeah, CLGU. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every, 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 everyone knows he's 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 come back, yeah. Yeah. Say comeback and <laughs> it's CLGU. Yeah. But this is oh. what I mean. I just say comeback and you know the exact game I mean because that's how memorable it was. So from a viewing aspect, that's incredible. Like it, All I need to say is one word and you still remember that game. It's still fresh in your mind. But I mean, I guess from a playing perspective, it's obviously very frustrating because I mean, first blood can happen for a number of reasons. You know, maybe there was just a slight hiccup in play. Maybe you stepped forward at just a little bit too much and that meant that you died to a jungle gang. And to be that punished from a playing perspective, it's quite aggravating sometimes. It's never, I mean, obviously, like, First Blood isn't, like, 100% of losses. Like you said, it's about 70. I think it's, like, 74% or 72%. It's something around that they said it was. Um, but Towers, I think, I think maybe at the minute they probably give too much gold and are probably too weak that's, slightly still. Same with the uh, Dragon I was, as well. Dragon, <clears throat> Dragon gives I too much gold. Yeah. I think coupled with that is, you know, the, the minions took a buff to the point where they can bring down towers on their own really easily, you know, a wave of, of 12 minions, etc. It's, it's going to do significant damage. And when that came about, it, it, rather than this, this idea of, uh, of the champions getting ahead, it's more a case of you having to actually split your attention between they could possibly do Baron, but there's 10 minions bottom, so we should really panic. And I think that's the problem is that that if they get ahead, minions give too much of an advantage. The fact that to keep in inhib in hips up, it's the real juggling act, and it's much less focused around uh, team fight control um, and and positioning of your team than kind of splitting your attention between the team fight and the minions. And I think we need to revert that and, like you said, make the make the towers easier to turtle underneath. No, I joked about Fortify, but I think that could actually bring back quite uh, uh, the chance to actually get some farm back yourself, stop the turret dives, um, and just stop the fast push that you see in the early games. Um, yeah, and, and I was yeah. wanting to pick up on a point that you said there, Theory, and I think it's a very good point. Um, I think minions have too much of an effect I yeah. think the ability to stack waves and push a tower with just two minion waves at, eight, at sort of four to six minutes is ludicrous. Like, minions do too much damage to turrets right now, and I think that that's a problem that is everyone is facing, that if you have a large minion wave bottom, just because that large minion wave is there means you, ha you can't get and protect a global objective that's going to give their team 500 gold apiece, like Baron or 300 gold apiece or whatever, you know. It's a large chunk of global gold that they're going to get in favour of them. And you just couldn't do it because you're going to lose your inhibitor tower because there's so many minions stacked at that turret. And that's the problem with the fast push because once you lose a tower, it's so easy for the other team to stack minions down that wave because there's nothing stopping them once they get to that point in the lane. And this is what everyone's struggling with and this is what the Koreans do so well is that they push these outer towers, all of them, and then they push the waves up so you can't... You, if you go to deal with one lane, they'll group and take the bottom lane that's furthest away so you can't get there. And then there'll be another chunk of global gold in their favour and all you've got out of it is 20 CS for one of the people that's gone to deal with it. Um, it's, I heard it's, someone's hypothetical argument that in a similar way of a clairvoyance reveals the area, that if a support could take Summoner Spell, which cleared the area of minions, you wouldn't gain the gold from it, how much that would change the game. Because it would, it would mean that the top lane's safe on a global scale from that early game um, and you can you, you know you're sacrificing something but it, it could be a 60 second it could be a 1 minute 20 kind of summoner spell that actually it, 
it impairs the fact that you don't get the gold from it, but it could really make things interesting. And I think they're going to have to bring something like that in to, to change it, um, because otherwise you're going to slip back to this this hour-long game kind of thing where it's actually really hard to close out the game. There's got to be such a balance put in place and it's, it's going to be very hard to do. The problem with the, with with that idea is that you, you effectively deny out a strategy and the strategy I'm thinking of is split pushing um, because, I mean, Riot made this really clear because they did it with the, when they buffed the early towers. So, as, as you all know, that for the first 10 minutes, the towers get more armor um, yep. So they can't be pushed as quickly, um, and the reason for that is Riot was like, well, it is. It's a it's a legitimate strategy that we don't want to destroy. We don't want to remove it from the game, but it, it's a bit too strong of a strategy, so we want to nerf it a bit. And things like the split push strategy is a really effective, strong strategy that I mean, Fnatic are well renowned for. Um, but you, you can't just if you had that tactic, you could effectively deny the split push strategy. Which uh, which which is difficult for Riot to deal with. Um, yeah, I mean, and 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 similarly, the thing is, you'd have to put it in in a way that it would be detrimental your, to your team fight and laning phase. Exactly. But yeah. give you some safety in terms of we can actually counter this strategy by choosing some of the spells. Yeah. The problem is, some at, at the minute, you know, you could go through the picking phase, and I know the picking phase should be important, but you can go through and actually come out with a really weak team, and and you can't even do anything about it with with the spread of some of the spells you've kind of got now. Um, you know, lots of some of the spells have been left redundant. Again, I haven't seen Clairvoyant picked up in a long, long time. Don't say that to Civ HD. Don't ever say <laughs> that in Civ HD. <laughs> and, uh, but in terms of like the summer spells that are there to as a safety net or as as a way of making plays yourself, they're there to to say, right, we've got this comp but we want to change it up in this way and you know, Fnatic do that by taking the double teleport and, and stuff like that. And and if the some of the spells become stale I think that's where things start to kind of go wrong in terms of the game becomes very stale. The thing is, I feel that the idea of that summoner spell, which you're talking about, where you clear a patch of minions, whatever, with no gold reward, I see massive issues with that in terms of trolling. That would be a troll haven. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you're going to bring back a summoner spell, though, just to like deal with this issue of split pushing, if you just bring back Fortify as a targeted tower, yeah. Like enhancement or targeted a tower vulnerability for like, say, 10, 15 seconds, what, however long you want to say. Or if you brought back um, that spell, which you were saying, but instead of doing it as a damage, do it as an area heal for your own minions to push back. That could be something, but then of course, then that also means that that wave that's pushing could then be healed and then. <laughs> I, don't bear, I think yeah, Fortify works this best. Ridiculous I think split Fortify works best. Think of it, think of it this um, way Ohm Wrecker, right? Yeah, Ohm Wrecker having <laughs> Ohm Wrecker having an active on your own towers to fortify the tower, but it's global. Man, it has a massive go. massive cooldown, right? Talking like Riot, a, I don't know, like bad. two, like you know, three minute cooldown maybe. But think of the, uh, think of the idea that a support buys an Ohm Wrecker and is able to stop a split push. Guys, I just want to say that that a few seconds. There is a skit. There is an item that turns one of your minions into effectively a super minion. Yeah, uh, banner, yeah. Of banner of command. Yeah, banner of command, right? Now, <laughs> this is a legitimate strategy that has been used, right? Oh, and basically Here what you go. do, yeah, you take AP Janet. Now, these, um, who am I thinking of? Manchester Penguins did this. They took, Fuck. they didn't do this legitimate strategy, but they, they took AP Janet top, right? And all you do is you split push all the time. You run flash TP, split push, split push, and you buy banner of command, right? And you split push with the Janna, and you constantly use that on your minions, and it's unstoppable. It's literally unstoppable because the minions are too strong, and because of Janna's CC, it's impossible to kill her as well. So that sort of split push is sort of just just thrown out there that that sort of split push is how would you deal with that? I mean, like things like Banner of Commander, an item that nobody's really thought of that might actually be really effective at things like countering the split push. Because all you need to do is when the minions spawn, you make one of yours that just come out of the necklace nice and strong, and that'll push back the wave quite significantly. And um, the problem is, is the fact that you you're in this situation again where you you haven't you're still having to go 
elsewhere to deal with the split push. You still have to take a, a back to the base in order to get there for right, when your you mean, minions yeah. coming off. And and at that point, you're sacrificing any chance of a team fight. You see this, these ridiculously length back and forth around a barren pit, a barren pit, and nothing actually happens. And it's so frustrating to watch. And it's even more frustrating to play because the, you're the, like, we yeah. just want something to happen, but. There's the too problem, much risk. The, the problem is with that is if you show and it's someone who can't get to the team fight instantly, there's too many hard engages from too many champions that are usually picked up to initiate a 4v5. And, and you, you're going to be caught with your pants down. You either give up the objective or risk getting engaged on. And it, it's, it's something that's it's, it's very hard to deal with. And it, it, it's, it is partly due to, to the way that the meta's evolved in terms of this big split push strategy and... It's something split pushing has always been in League of Legends, but not to this extent. I don't think. I don't. Yeah. I think split pushing used to be the tactic that you'd run and have someone annoyance top, but you would never look to. You would always never look to engage from it, and you you you, would, you wouldn't try and take objectives. That you just have someone top and send people to deal with it, and then the rest like of your team singed. do something else. Singed yeah. is a good example. But yeah. leading on from this, guys, because we've got to wrap up moderately soon. Um, <laughs> I wanted to run into uh, the jungle and support, and there's something that uh, Zan can pick up on. What do you, uh, there was a big changes in season three to the support role, and they tried to bring out a lot of new items, um, but essentially, like supports have still become the ward machine, and that's essentially what they've kind of molded back into, despite all these new items. Like I barely ever see Shard of True Ice picked up. Um, I think I saw it picked up one or two games throughout the entire Best few seasons. Item. <laughs> so, what do you guys think of the current jungle and gold support flows? Uh, so, gold flows because they don't get a lot of gold, and, and unless you're Meteos in the jungle, you find it's hard to get the same amount of gold that any of your laners will get. Uh, do you think this is something that is good in league, or do you think that, that they need to improve the gold flow in both of these areas? I think they need to nerf, like in terms of supports, they need to nerf some ratios on certain champions. I mean. Zyra, I'm particularly thinking of, is way too powerful with AP at the minute. Um, like, I still don't think that her ratios are that great, but they're good enough such that if she gets ahead by one or two levels, she can start soloing mid laners. And that's just completely ridiculous. Like, how can a support just 1v1 on mid at, like, the 15 minute mark of the game if they're not fed? Like, in my eyes, that's just ridiculous. And also, um, Fiddle's become particularly bad for it. Um, Sona, to a certain extent, has got pretty bad for it. And the whole idea of supports is that they're meant to be high base stats in, on their spells, but poor scaling. That's like the entire like meta of what supports were meant to be. And lately, the newer supports that have come out, um, I'm thinking particularly Thresh, his E, or what used to be his Q, the extra bonus damage on his autos, is one of the most ridiculous mechanics I can think of to put on a support champion. If you're going to give someone free damage, that only ever scales up pretty much through the game. Because I mean, also they get, he gets AP obviously from collecting souls, so all of his damage goes up in general. If you're gonna start focusing things around where they have decent AP scaling, they have decent damage in like the mid-late game. Well, I say early, not mid-late game, the mid and then late mid game. Um, if you start doing that with supports, you then start edging out things which were originally core to the support role, such as goal per 10 quints. And gold per 10 quints is one of the main reasons now why supports are really lacking gold. And why would they've gone back to being, well, supports have gone back to being these ward bots, essentially. is because in lane now, I don't remember the last time I've actually seen a decent support player, anyway, in my opinion, run gold per 10 quints in lane. Because it's just useless. If you're going to run anything, it's normally AP, or it's movement speed, or it's extra armor. You're always going for the extra advantage in lane. You don't care about the mid game and the late game in terms of what you're going for your runes. So I think they need to pull back the scaling and then allow the uh, to come back in. Yeah, and I, I think what you've said there is, is very true for some supports. And uh, I want to particularly look at the jungle now. Um, Riot have said they're not happy with the way that the jungle works and the amount of gold you generate as a jungler. You often feel very behind coming into the mid game and you've kind of just like, you're there as, as a distraction or initiator and then you're just there to sort of mill around. And right, I've often said they want to do more for the jungler because it just it feels like you're playing a very mediocre or lackluster role compared to a laner. What do you guys think? Because I'm a jungler by main usually. Um, 
I've personally never had any trouble in the jungle in terms of getting the items I want, if you play correctly. Um, yeah. I've always thought that the farm you can get is, is decent, and the, 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 the nice the increase in gold and the minions is nice, and if you pull off enough ganks, you can often either pick up kills or assists, and often if you, if you do your job as a jungler properly, that you don't need to have the same amount of gold, but Riot have expressively stated that they don't like the amount of gold that junglers get, and I think it's because a lot of the pro junglers often, often find that they, they, they feel lackluster, and if they don't play their jungle, because jungle is such a fickle role to play, if you play it a tiny bit wrong, you're useless, but if you play it a tiny bit right, you're the most potent, yeah. almost one of the most potent members on your um, team. I would suggest um, that all junglers camp mid lane more because <laughs> if you just, to be honest, that's that's probably the best way for junglers to make gold if you just gank mid more often. Well, the problem that I face is that I'm often in jungle forced to roll the dice either, either playing them two ways, either playing a super aggressive jungler that if you pull off a good invade or a good early gank, you're going to be able to snowball or one where I don't care about gold at all and I just literally want to set up a team fight and and um, that just seems crazy to me like Lee Sin literally for, for how many games have I taken my red buff legged it to their red buff and killed someone and this is at like diamond level so these are like retarded people but the whole game I rely on the, that kind of early game advantage or, alternatively, I go for someone like Zach or Nautilus, where I'm like, who cares? I've got a crap load of CC, and, and providing I don't just die straight away, I'm going to be good. There's got to be a balance in between that, that you know, is good for both of them. Oh, My uh, issue would... Oh, sorry, go on. Go ahead, Space. I was only, only going to say, um, the as... And I think it was Andy was saying, camping mid lane is the most efficient thing for a jungler. Uh, I want to just say that the reason for that, not just because once uh, a few of the mids have burned or flashed that they're, you know, they've got no gap closers, it's because all of the gold that they can farm is beside mid lane. Uh, you're right beside your wolves and your race. Golems aren't efficient to go and farm unless you're near top lane. If you are on blue side, okay, and you go to gank for top lane, Where's your gold income if that fails? You, yeah. If you fail a top lane gank and you're on blue side, there is not a single thing for you to farm and you've got to travel halfway down a map just so you can get some golden EXP if you fail really a gank. Point. And, that, and does that, that is awful. And, and what, does that open up the window for a further camp to be introduced then? Well, what it does is that right now in solo queue, if you were going diamond plat solo queue, now, every, almost every jungler does this. If you're on blue side, you start red, blue, top lane. If you, if you think that you can 2v2 as a top laner in the jungler versus their top lane in the jungler, you're going to 2v2 meet their, their jungler top lane and fight. If that fails, or nothing happens, red side gets, well, sorry, purple side actually benefits because they can go back to farm. Whereas blue side's completely fucked. They've got to go back to their jungle, which is halfway down the map, and they lose out completely from it. Uh, what they have said is they are reworking the map next season, and I could imagine they're going to balance out or mirror the jungle so that no matter what lane you go to, there will be some kind of gold income very close to where your ga where your lane is. Yeah, my, uh, I. Uh, yeah, ca sorry, carry on. Um. Uh, I was only going to say that my my current issue with the jungle is the. Is a limited choice um, because back in season two, I know things like Maokai were like he was my favorite jungler personally, but it didn't have to just be Maokai. Things like Lee Sin was still really viable. You could either play that really supporty jungler or you could play the really aggressive jungler. But now that the the jungle seems to be more, it's less about clear time and more about damage output. Like I remember somebody telling me, uh, my my friend, he's in gold three or something, and I and I was still running attack speed on my runes and he said why do you do that and I said because that's what you run in jungle isn't it and he said no 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 you just go full AD yeah. just full AD in the jungle because there's no point it's not about the clear time all you want to do get your blue buff get your red buff gank that's all it is that's, that's all you want to do you just want as much attack damage and I think well that's a really boring way to play the jungle and he goes yeah it is but that's how you win games <laughs> so things no, it's, like it's, it's, it's the same I mean when I run uh, any jungler now that is AD based 
I run full AD. It's the only way to clear camps quick enough to get to the ganking potential. That because right now the jungler is in a state of most junglers will go their bottom buff, their top buff, top lane, and it's a race to see who can get there first. Yeah. And that's that is just the most common jungle path in solo queue right now. Um, people or if you're if you're if you're oat germ, it's bottom buff. Top buff mid. <laughs> <laughs> then mid 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 yeah, mid mid, buffs. mid 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 mid. <laughs> I actually want to expand on what Kieran said about about doing. You know, you you start from the bottom side of the jungle and go at the top. I dual queue with Kieran quite a bit, and I say to him, and I say to him right at the start of the game, I'll pick Jax, and I'll say, we've got a Lee Sin and a Jax. What's the what's the Lee Sin gonna do? It's gonna go bottom to top. The other jungler has two options. He starts top to bottom, okay, and avoids the top lane two v two scenario. Or he's dumb and he starts bottom to top, then goes to like two v two, and he gambles. And it happens every single game. And it's and, and the, the problem with the top lane is that that used to happen less when a ward in top lane was the one of the more viable. Like you know when people used to start eight pot two ward or something yeah. like that. Like that was. That meant that junglers would not gank the top lane because you knew there was no way. But now people are starting door and shield pop because door and shield is is broken. Like just the amount of health regen and extra health you get right now is pretty OP. And the fact that it reduces eight damage per auto attack. People now know that that most top laners will not start a ward. So top lane is the most easily gankable lane. And the fact that mid laners now will sometimes start wards or sometimes won't. And also because mid lane is such a short lane, it's often hard to get a decent gank off. You'll almost at best waste a flash unless you get a really decent gank off. In top lane, because it's such a long lane, you can waste a flash and then still get the kill. And that, and that's that's why because of just the way that top lane's evolved. And then it's because Riot limited the pots. So now starting five pots in a ward means you've got all this leftover gold and you feel a bit lackluster with what you've done with the starting. Also means you'll get forced out of lane pretty quickly if the other top laner knows what they're doing. And that's just how uh, the tops kind of evolved. That's why top has become. Um, the mostly the first thing to go. Everyone in solo queue will say, "I start red, blue top," or "I start blue, red top," and that's just how it goes. Right. And mine's mine's different at Scoundrel. Mine's I start red, straight to their red. <laughs> yeah, because I know what they're, you're like. because they're, that's they're, that's, they're, that's for they're... your jungler only. That's for your certain champion. No, Have no, you... no. Elise, Nautilus, Amumu. I do it on everyone. They, <laughs> they, what they, the they fuck? Run. They run the full AD no. runes, right? So they're forced to chug pots continuously to stay above half HP. So if you go up to their red and you land any kind of stun or any kind of damage with extra red damage on, they're forced to back off from it. And they can't help that. That's just, that's how it's gone. And you say you run these flat AD runes. That's like, that just means that they're so kind of vulnerable in the jungle yeah. always. I, I, I yeah. want to actually expand on that just a second because this this was actually things that were happening. Uh, playing at Diamond, there's a few things which people do do, yeah. which is the red to red strategy, which is only done on very on more aggressive counter junglers, like a Mumu. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> funnily enough, do yeah. It. Do was, it at Diamond, it worked. There was a game in which I was playing as LeBlanc and uh, Kieran, I think, was playing the jungler. And we said at the start of the game, everybody said this by when fucking support even said it, I'm going to ward the back of your red buff. And he was like, okay, fair enough. Because he's the way to come with your red buff. I can bet you any money. What happens? Walks into red buff. Bot lane and mid lane just collapsed on him. First blood. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. That happens a lot at higher elo. And especially in rank fives. The moment somebody goes, a oh, jungler's in my jungle, you just get the entire yeah, team going, tell us it, where he is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the, it's the problem is that if you get there too late, and he's just done red buff, and that's and what then I do every, that's you it's, fucked. It's a massive gamble, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. But when you're running, works. flat AP Amumu, you're never going <laughs> to lose. <laughs> Guys, I mean seriously, if you've got 50 ability power on Amumu, oh, you're not man. getting away. Oh, God, <laughs> I want to use now. Stream it now. <laughs> anyway, ladies, um, we're going to move on to our last topic because we're going to have to wrap up fairly soon. Um, Jinx is coming out, and she's oh. supposed to be coming out today or tomorrow. Um, <laughs> She has abilities that make her pretty potent in both 
early laning phase and late game. Now she has her Q, which switches between her two guns. Her first gun has Graves range, which is the mini gun, and then her second gun gets increased range, much like Cogmore's W, his um, bio arcane barrage, much more like that. It gets increased range, and she has like ten less range than Cogmore, so she gets to like a Cogmore-esque range at max rank of it. She also has a skill shot stun grenade type thing. Um, as well as whatever the, I don't even know what her E does, and then she's got her cross right across uh, execute like a, like an ash arrow but an execute. <laughs> so basically, it's like, a, it's she, like she, a Caitlyn ult, basically. Yeah, like, like a Caitlyn ult, but you don't better. have to channel yeah. it, and yeah. uh, also it, it does damage based on the percentage of your missing health. So and it's a bit it's of an global. execute, and it's global, and it so, looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, what do you guys think Jinx is going to be like? And do you think she's going to be one of the more overpowered AD carries in the game, or do you well, think she's going to be like Cogmore and... I'm running her mid. It doesn't matter. I'm running her mid. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing as Riot. well. She sounds <laughs> dumb Riot as fuck like mid. Pretty, pretty... I don't know. They've, they've not been liking to make champions OP, which is surprising because it doesn't sell their champions very much, so... Let's hope it's not another Lucian. I mean, I just like the look of her, so I'm gonna play her. Well, regardless. she looks like so much fun. Like she's possibly really good, yeah. the most. fun. she just. I'm so excited because if you compare her to Lucian, who do you think is more fun? I mean, it's... oh man, <laughs> Lucian you had how potential. We were over Graves. Fucking Graves on release. Oh my god. Excited. Yeah, why wouldn't you be excited over release Graves? <laughs> That's oh pretty my. Ridiculous. Do you guys remember like fucking release Vane? Like what was that shit yeah. all about? Oh, I remember when <laughs> I remember when Vayne was released. Everyone was like, "This is the shittest AD in the game. Why would anyone make this AD?" And yeah. then everyone and realized, then all of a sudden it "Oh was shit!" Like, no, Vayne. <laughs> Do you remember release Jarvan? No, I wasn't. I wasn't that old. <laughs> all right, okay, I have a better. Do you guys remember release Nocturne? Oh no, yeah. don't talk about that. <laughs> 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 Fucking the amount of times you used to see Infinity Edge and Bloodthirst or Nocturnes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like oh, all of us is, was literally right, back, the same age as Nocturne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah, in yeah. Terms of, in terms of Jinx, I think that she's going to be a very similar to Draven. I think she's going to be a lame bully. Um, uh, but because I've never played her, I reckon... Yeah, similar to Caitlyn as well. Um, but uh, the the... Because I haven't played it, I don't know what items will work on it. Like, me and my flatmate were having this discussion earlier. Like, it'll either be Bloodthirst the Last Whisper, or it will be the Rush IE. But it depends on how her AD scalings work. Because mm -hmm. someone like Caitlyn, because her scalings are so good, you generally rush the IE because she's better in the late game. Um, but somebody like Draven, because of his early, his early dominance, you want to rush as much damage as you can. Uh, for that early game pressure, so you go for the Bloodthirster uh, Last Whisper. Um, so I, I, I'm really curious as to see how she scales, um, because I reckon that will really dictate how she'll be played. Mm. What no, I'm calling like... it now, she's going to be Urgot version 2. You're That's asking. what I'm saying. <laughs> she's either going to be, at any point in time, she'll either be broken or useless. That is my call. <laughs> she's only going to be one end of the scale or the other. She's not going to be anywhere in between. What because scares me is is how fast her abilities are uh, able to be used because like what struck me is her laser seems pretty slow. Her grenades might the ones that stun might actually be like really slow to use. And in that case, she's you know, she's gonna be useless. But on the other hand, yeah. if they work swimmingly, then it's gonna be amazing. How do you if you were playing uh as Jinx, how on earth would you ever survive a Jinx, uh a Vi Shen Gang? Like you how don't, do you escape that? You don't, exactly, you and that's our that's our counterplay, because that's she has. Counterplay. It's 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 like Cogmore. Like it, Cogmore is brutal if you leave him alone, but you gank him. He's got nothing. He's got nothing to yeah, say yeah. about it. And that's what I mean, though. It's like she's only ever going to be if you've got a lame, uh, or if you've got a team rather, which is really easy to get into the back line and has a lot of control. Like like saying like five shents, like just that's pretty common combo, really. But like that kind of idea if you have that on the enemy team you're never going to pick jinx because it's just it's a dumb idea right like you're not no. going to pick someone that doesn't have a jump or some form of self-defense to get away from like two really heavy dominant characters like that you you can play her in like i guess more safe games but well, that's that's why i like the way the bot lane is the bot lane is once once obviously the triforce gets nerfed a little bit more bot lane will be so balanced yeah. uh, 
because MF Maybe. will come back in. I think MF's going to come back in a favor. Uh, Graves will come back in a favor due to Triforce being nerfed again. If it does get nerfed, that is. Because uh, the only reason that Graves got pushed out was because of the meta change, which was obviously pushing down towers early. And the, and the problem that Graves had was he didn't have the range to actually, you know, poke down towers, poke down the enemy top planer, as we're going to call them, and then do the tower as well, because he was too almost in range for for tower aggro. On that note, did you know that, I didn't know this, right, but Graves has a smaller range than Vayne. Yeah. She actually has a smaller, yeah. which, which I had no idea. I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> Graves is like 525, five, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's and Vayne's is five, like 540. Five five it's 550, and then the majority of AD carries, so 575. Five, five. Ash yeah, is and 6. Then, Five. 600 with Varus as well. Varus is 600, I think. Yeah. Okay, and then you've obviously got Caitlyn at the top, yeah. That's why Varus um, is a comp pick against Caitlyn, because he doesn't yeah, exactly. get as hard. Very con yeah, but like, this is also why people say, I don't know why, but people say Graves count as Varus. And I sit there and think, why? <laughs> I play a lot of Varus. It's um, it's because Var it's because Varus has no es real escape mechanism. Graves got a skill shot. Uh, sorry, a um, a, a dash ability as well yeah. as a, a high burst skill shot. If you can get in range of if Graves, uh, if Graves in range of Varus to get a three bullet or even a two bullet buckshot off, you do a lot of damage. And then just by using attack moving and the quick draw attack speed bonus, you can actually burst him down before he can burst you down. It's just the the fact that Graves beats Varus because his burst is a lot quicker than Varus's burst. And yeah, exactly. because. Graves is passive as well. It means that he's yeah. not very easily harassable to long range, so... Give Graves, Graves a high range. Really ...ish mm. against Kate. Screw, screw range. Blitzcrank Jace. That's that was such that shit. Shit. So <laughs> shit. It's not shit. Me and that, Theory won that, so many games That's like That's Jace. like saying, oh yeah, um, Space and Spookies, Hook City is viable. It's really <laughs> not. What about Oriana Jace? <laughs> Me and Rods used to run that in NUL like the first half of last season, like every game. <laughs> People didn't know how to deal with it. I remember first, Rods playing first... fucking Jace. I think that was because he was OP ish. That's because that's because uh, Jace was OP as shit back then. Yeah. I think that was more than that. Like his E used to like chunk you for like twelve percent of your health in one go. <laughs> <laughs> like like what is that? You didn't like you didn't even need to level it. It was like a one didn't... level ability. Didn't I for one kill like once we we pushed up to the turret and I just flashed over the wall by turret grabbed someone and you just killed them in one shot? It was something ridiculous. Yeah, it We've was, got it recorded somewhere. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's so funny. That used to be amazing. That's another but champion yeah. who didn't have counterplay as well for a while. Yeah. Fucking but I'll tell you, Jace. Jace. Thing about Jace like, a lot of nerfs, yeah. What I um what I thought interesting going back to the bot lane now was um the the fact that. A lot of champions, I mean, I think Genja illustrated this the most, right? Um, and I remember seeing an interview with him where everyone was like, why do you build Trinity Force on someone like Cogmore? And he goes, well, basically, I build it because champions that lack mobility get mobility with Trinity Force. Like, and I didn't really, I sat there and thought, no, that's rubbish. If any of you, right, have ever played against an Ezreal who runs Trinity Force, you cannot keep up with him. Nope. Like, ever. Like, his mobility is ridiculous. Now, if you think about a Cogmore who has something like two attack speed, he, if he's constantly hitting you, he's constantly getting that movement speed, so he can constantly kite you. So having this Trinity Force, I think, has really enabled AD carries to be a lot more independent and a lot less reliant on their supports, um, which is why I think champions like Leona have come into favor a lot more, because they can actually get into the fray and not have to worry about the AD carry, because they can just kite for themselves. That's why I and like I... the AD carry meta right now. Beforehand, I don't know if you remember Doublelift saying that he hated playing AD carry, yeah. because AD carry was just, it was completely irrelevant. At the point where mid and top and jungle, tanky bruisers and assassins, it was like, oh, so what are we going to do? Well, I'm playing Vayne. Oh, well, that's that's the game <laughs> fucked now, isn't it? And it's a shame because AD carry is a great role and it requires synergy with another person, like so yeah. close synergy. And the idea that supporting AD carry is seen as one of the roles that needs babysitting. And supports are completely in, like, supports in team fights are influential. Map control, they're influential as hell, but they don't feel item influence and and for them to give the AD carry all of the gold and other AD carries are just being uh, their, their weaknesses are showing so hard like you see Graves 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 is supposed to be a lane bully where is he now 
Because you've got Caitlyn, who's also a lane bully, but she's got two like almost 200 range more than him. <laughs> you know, and does his job better, and pushes towers, and is in the meta. Uh, MF, what's wrong with MF is mobility problems. Triforce might be good, but and that's just the way it is. It's just the meta. Maybe this comes back to, you know, the mid lane meta and the fact that they can just kill out. I mean, as soon as that's dealt with, as soon as the fact that a mid lane can't just rape you in the ass when yeah. you're, when you're an AD carry. <laughs> I prefer the all I in mean... meta. Like, do you remember back when it was like, remember when Zin Zhao, right? Now Zin Zhao had his audacious charge, and then he used to ult, and it would yeah, it would back everyone except from his target away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like that, like he would die from that because he had to go in on his target. Like there was no escape for him. He goes in and he dies. That's that's what he does. Same with Talon and Kali. They go in and die, or yeah. they, that's it. They go in and die trying. Yeah, of course. That was back in the. If any of you used to read Moba Fire guides, yeah. right? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I remember reading an. Uh, oh, who was it? A brand guide, right? And they basically said, as long as you get your combo down, yep. it doesn't matter if you die. Just get your combo down. That's all that matters. Just get a combo down onto anyone. It doesn't matter. As long as you get your combo down, it doesn't matter. You're welcome to die. Do you remember and when I brand was OP? Yeah. Brand was fucking annoying. I miss Brand. Brand is still OP. <laughs> Brand was like fun because the whole idea that as long as you could like unload your jizz on someone else, then it didn't matter, right? As long yeah. as you could like flash and just fucking like W and R and like jizz came out of your pants, right? That's, that's all that mattered. Like playing you know Talon I... and E and on to someone and just ulting your entire team. The, the like, good that old shit was it's fun. Like Can I just say? Really relevant YouTube link right now. Really, really relevant. <laughs> yeah, have no. you guys, have you guys um, seen Annie Bot's Annie Guide for playing Annie in the late game? She says, she, she she basically fire, says uh, that. So he basically says that if you're playing Annie in the late game, the only way you're going to stay relevant in the late game is if you flash Tibbers their carries. Yeah, if you flash Tibber your carries, or like you manage to get a five man stun. Oh my god, that yeah. music! I'm turning that off now. It's a little but, bit. <laughs> raw I think for me but like I, I definitely agree it's uh, somehow we've managed to get from Jinx to the meta again but, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah I think but, the uh, meta's just, more interesting we know just, what Jinx uh, just, is gonna be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just as a final point I, I would say that um, that the once because I love assassins I mean if, if any of you look at my match history it's basically just Ari Zed Fizz um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I play them because they because they win me games, not yeah. because necessarily they're fun. Um, but I, I the champions that I really enjoy are champions like Victor, Malzahar, Vigar, those those good old AP mages where all you did was drop your combo and die. That's okay. That's those, a Zerath those are the good old days. Like and the the truly skilled ones, the ones the god people who would flash in and kill, were the ones who bought mesh eyes because it doesn't matter if you died because you you would. Only lose, you you'd were only a hero. lose you, yeah, you'd only lose one stack, but you'd gain two, so it was always worth it. <laughs> so, <laughs> do, you, do you not remember when uh, Bloodthirster was changed? Remember how, like, it, on Bloodthirster, right? I remember running us as talent. This was my talent build, right? You would get your boots one, then you would stack three Bloodthirsters, and then <laughs> you would contemplate Last Whisper, depending on how fed you were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like. The thing, the fun thing was, is when you had like you know four bloodthirsts. I had four bloodthirsts. That was my thing, right? And then you last whisper, right? If you died, you lost all your stacks, and you have to start again. <laughs> but it was like, see when you got stacks on it, right? And you jumped onto people, and you just like wiped them from the game. It was like you went into the program, into the code, and we're like deleted variable. You know, it was like that, and it was good. It was good fun, and the whole risk reward thing was great. It was exciting. Uh, yeah. Morgana, remember Ken and Morgana, the running running our combo, or even Sion. Sion was good fun. Shut like, up, Sion was never fun and does not deserve to be a champion. Right. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, shit. I think we're veering completely off topic here now. So I'm going to have to say we're going to wrap it up now, guys. We've been going for a hell of a lot longer than we were supposed to be going for. So um, I'd like to say thank you to all for coming on. So uh, Space, Dan, Andy, uh, Avidius, Zenogra, uh, Sebastian, Tom, Theory Baby, and obviously Josh, and I'm Kiernan, I'm a scoundrel. Uh, had a really okay. good time. Hopefully we'll be doing this every so often, probably after a couple of tournaments or so. Uh, we might have different special guests for you next time. So thank you to Zan and uh, Andy for coming along. No and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys next time. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And just Cheers, as a, guys. 
at the end of the point with the stream, uh, make sure to be checking out our Twitter page at the new, not new, the new, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and also our Facebook page as well. And also make sure to keep check on uh, League of Legends UK Reddit as well for any kind of updates. We update all the time and they get stickied by me, so make sure to just keep updated. Uh, is that everything for everyone else? Uh, if anyone wants tickets for the Cardiff Hype Train, just message me and they can have one. <laughs> That's going to get a really hard to reel quite soon, my friend. Just wait, man. I'm going to come back to mid lane and I'm going to play for Dundee and I'm going to show you that Super 8. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for watching, guys. And yeah, cheers for watching, else. guys. Cheers. And let me know. Okay. Bye, guys. And have a good Bye. time.